Hello friends, this video on Atoms part 5 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. Please make sure that you have watched all the videos till part 4 before going ahead with part 5. So now let us talk about the electron orbits. So the two important things which Rutherford told us was, one was nucleus, he told us about nucleus and the second was the electron orbits. So we have already discussed about the nucleus part. So now it is time to discuss the electron orbits. So what did, I mean, what did he tell about the electron orbits? So according to Rutherford's model, nucleus was at the center and the electrons were revolving around it. So there was a force between the electron and the nucleus as I mentioned in the previous slide that the why are the electrons held in those orbits? It is because of an electrostatic force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron. So what is this electrostatic force of attraction? It is denoted as Fe. Now since this is my nucleus and this is my electron which is revolving somewhat like this. So there is one electrostatic force of attraction but at the same time since it is moving in a circular orbit there is a centripetal force. So this electrostatic force of attraction gets balanced by the centripetal force. Right? Now what is the electrostatic force of attraction? It is nothing but given by Coulomb's law 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into charge on an electron that is E into charge on the nucleus. So let us denote the charge on the nucleus as Ze divided by R square. So this is equal to the centripetal force which is nothing but mv square by R. So this R and this R will get cancelled. So from this we can say that R is equal to Ze square divided by 4 by epsilon naught into 1 by mv square. So from this we can say R is equal to Ze square divided by 4 pi epsilon naught mv square. So what is this? This R is the radius of the orbit in which the electron is moving. So often this R is known as orbit radius. And what is this V? This V is the electron velocity, that is the velocity with which the electron is moving around the nucleus, right? So this is how Rutherford defined the orbit of an electron, that he told that electrons will move in orbits, so what would be the radius of that orbit and with what velocity the electron would be moving would be given by this expression. So now from this expression, he also evaluated the kinetic energy associated with the moving electron. So the kinetic energy denoted by K is nothing but half mv square, right? So this will be half m into v square. So v, v what we can write v as, so from the previous uh, expression of orbit radius, we can write velocity in terms of radius r. So this will be z e square divided by 4 pi epsilon naught m r. So this m and this m will get cancelled. So we get z e square divided by 8 pi epsilon naught r. So this would be the kinetic energy associated with the moving electron. Now let us talk about the potential energy. Potential energy denoted by u is given by 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into q1. q1 is the charge on the electron into Q2 that is the charge on uh, the nucleus. So this charge is positive and this charge is negative. Right? So this divided by R that is R is the distance between the electron and the nucleus. So this comes out to be minus Z e square divided by 4 pi epsilon naught R. So this is the potential energy associated with the system. So now that we have calculated kinetic energy as well as potential energy, we can very well calculate the total energy. So what would be the total energy involved? That is kinetic energy plus potential energy. It comes out to be Z e square divided by 8 pi epsilon naught R plus minus Z e square divided by 4 pi epsilon naught R. So this comes out to be minus Z e square divided by 8 pi epsilon naught R. So this is the total energy associated with the electrons. 
Now, what do we observe from this? We see that the total energy is has a negative sign with it. What does it show? This shows that the electrons are bound to the nucleus. Had the total energy been positive, in that case, it would have meant that the electrons are not bound to move in the orbits. They can, they are free and they can move anywhere, right? So this total energy ca calculated by Rutherford also supported his observation and conclusion because he he had told that electrons move in orbits so this calculation of total energy also supported his statement that since the total energy is negative that means the electrons are bound to the nucleus and they are bound in this electron orbits right so now from this what do we observe if you look at the, these three expressions of kinetic energy potential energy and total energy you would see that kinetic energy is nothing but negative of total energy i mean magnitude of the kinetic energy and total energy is the same so you can say that kinetic energy is negative of total energy similarly if you compare the potential energy with the total energy you can see that potential energy is twice of the total energy so you can say that potential energy is equal to twice of the total energy right so this was all uh, that was told by Rutherford regarding the electron orbits. So this was Rutherford's model of atom. Now this Rutherford's model was able to explain many things successfully. It could explain the existence of nucleus, the arrangement of electrons, the electron orbits. Uh, so it could explain a plenty of things. However, this model also had certain limitations. So let us look at the limitations of the Rutherford's model. The first limitation was it could not explain the stability of an atom. Why it could not explain the stability? Because Rutherford told that electrons are moving around the nucleus and it is moving in orbits because it is balanced by the electrostatic force of attraction. Now, electrons should be attracted by the positively charged nucleus every now and then, right? So now, according to the electromagnetic theory of Maxwell, if you remember your lesson on electromagnetic waves, you'd remember that Maxwell had given his theory stating that charged particles, when accelerated, they emit electromagnetic radiation. So this was a theory which was well, very well proved and given by Maxwell. He told that whenever there is a charged particle which is accelerated, it will emit electromagnetic radiation. So now if you look at these electrons, what are these electrons? They are charged particles, negatively charged particles. They are also getting, since they are getting attracted by the nucleus, so they are also getting accelerated as they are moving on their circular orbits. Therefore, these accelerated negatively charged electrons should also emit electromagnetic radiation. Now, if they are emitting electromagnetic radiation, then what's happening? In that case, the orbit of the elect revolving electron will keep on becoming smaller and smaller following a spiral path and ultimately the electron will fall into the nucleus. This is what it should happen. Let us suppose if this is my nucleus and if this is my electron. Now, uh, Rutherford told that electron moves in this orbit, right? Now, if this electron is, but he did not consider the emission of electromagnetic radiation. But according to Maxwell's theory, this electron being a charged particle, it is getting accelerated as it moves in this path. So it should emit some electromagnetic radiation. That means some part of its energy is lost in emitting this radiation. So as a result, this electron's radius will keep decreasing and gradually the electron will fall into the nucleus. So that means the atom will not be stable. But that is what, which doesn't happen actually, right? I mean, in reality or in nature, you see everything which is around yourself is made up of atom and things are stable, right? So that means there is something which defines the stability of atom, which Rutherford's model could not. So this became a very big limitation of Rutherford's model. Also, it says nothing about the electronic structure of atoms, that is, about the distribution and relative energies of electrons around the nucleus. Rutherford just told about the path followed by the electrons. He did not talk about like how many, I mean, every atom, when we talk of an atom, it does not consist of one electron, right? There are plenty of electrons. 
So Rutherford never spoke about the distribution of those n number of electrons. He just told that every electron will move in a in an orbit. But when there are hundred electrons, how will these those hundred electrons move in different orbits? Whether they will move in hundred different orbits or they will move in one orbit, or how will they get distributed? So he did not talk anything about that. So distribution and relative energies of electrons was not at all explained or discussed by Rutherford. Dual nature of electromagnetic radiation could not be explained. As we, you saw in our previous lessons that there were several experiments which proved that dual nature of radiation is true. That means every particle can behave as a particle as well as wave. Similarly, every wave can behave as a particle as well as wave. But Rutherford's model could not explain this dual nature. Experimental results regarding atomic spectral emission lines could not be explained. Now what are these atomic spectral emission lines? We will talk about them in detail in the next few slides. So these spectral lines uh, are a very important concept in science. I mean they are extremely useful in different uh, research work and all. So this uh, Rutherford model of atom could not explain anything about this um, uh, spectral lines. They could not explain why this spectral lines occur. Right? So these were some of the limitations of Rutherford's model because of which it was not a full proof or it was not completely accepted. However, it told many things which were correct. I mean, it was the first model to at least give an idea of the correct picture of atom, right? But there were so many disadvantages as well. So in order to overcome these disadvantages came up the next model that was the Bohr's model of atom. So now before we get into Bohr's model of atom, let us understand what is atomic spectra. Because here I mentioned you that uh, it could not explain the atomic spectral emission lines, right? So before you, uh, in, before I introduce the Bohr's model to you, it is good, that, uh, good if you understand what is atomic spectra. In that case, you will be able to understand the Bohr's model in a better way. So what is atomic spectra? Thank you. Please visit examfear.com to watch free educational videos, try free online tests, get the best quality study materials, study from the best tutors and mentors and much more. Thank you once again.